probably ask the same question that I asked uh, to the others speaker already. Yeah. Uh, another size of story what, what you have been asked. You probably have a lot of technology from the inventors in the, from the university. Do you have any criteria of prioritize which technology you want to forward of selling first? Marketing first, not selling. Oh, marketing okay. first. Do you have any criteria or any judgment that you think this particular this particular technology or this particular invention is worth to sell as a market nowadays is gone so fast. Shelf life of the technology or unit product have moved along so fast. So so probably this would time strength, time strength also coming in. Mm. So um, I'm sure we do. Um, the way Cambridge Enterprise works is that um, new invention disclosures coming in get assigned to a case manager. Um, and their role is to evaluate, investigate, patent, um, devise a, a, a patent prosecution strategy, which territories, all that sort of thing, come up with marketing materials, market the invention. So that's a decision that is taken certainly, you know, well lower down the organisation than, than uh, I sit. Um, and I think it's still uh, a structure that's um, perhaps uh, uh, unusual in that it's more aligned to a sort of professional structure, in that that case manager <coughs> really holds everything in their power to commercialise that technology or not and it's down to them to use their resource that they have to do that as f effectively as they can. Um, that said, obviously there, there's a, a periodic review process of what's in the portfolio and that may um, bring to bear the, the sort of arguments that, that you've raised there that you know some things look we've got to get it out now otherwise it you know we've we've missed the boat um, but usually i think we find that there are probably bigger considerations involved with talking to the academic or developing the technology it's it's not that we're gonna miss the boat if we don't market it now. It's more, you know, the technology is really early, the opportunities in the distance. We've got to develop the technology and hopefully, um, you know, serendipity will happen, things will coalesce <laughs> and um, then there'll be an opportunity to commercialise the technology. Um, very often, uh, and I think Kathy had an example um, this morning, you know, technology can take 10 years before you even find a licensee. We had something with, that we licensed either the last year or the year before, time flies so fast, um, which was a technology we'd had 10 years. It was a new thermocouple, um, which had some unique properties, um, particularly going to be useful for uh, aerospace. Uh, it took 10 years for other technologies to come on stream, for the value chain to align itself that this particular thermocouple technology was then going to be appropriate to be licensed. You know, we, we stuck with that technology for all of that time. Um, you know, fully aware that the clock's ticking on the patent and we're, you know, probably not going to get much in the way of royalties. Um, but that doesn't matter if the technology <coughs> gets out there. Um, and that, that's actually, if you remember from this morning when I discussed our revenue share and, and how, how it looks with the number of tiers um, and the distribution between academics and departments and Cambridge Enterprise, and how those change with the different, different tiers. And that's because we recognise that actually most of the things that we licence are unlikely to make more than 
30 or 40 um, thousand pounds. So in those cases, most of the money is going to go to the inventors. <coughs> and we're, we're happy to try and incentivize inventors at the lower end because of that. Yes. Yeah, I just Oh, they're going to want the microphone. <laughs> Got to have it recorded. You can, you can be candid on this one. <laughs> so it's a year from now. You um, decide you've had a bit with academics. And um, you've seen lots of startups. You're still a young guy. Do you go out if, if I was. Do you do your own startup? And if you do your own startup, do you go approach Cambridge to be your partner? Um, okay, let, let's, let's put the fact that I don't feel a young guy, and I definitely don't look it, um, and uh, that actually I'm at such a stage in my career that I don't talk to academics very often, so it's uh, not, not so daunting. Um, but would I approach my colleagues for investment? Yes, I would, um, because I think... Uh, our values and principles within the organisation are that we are trying to look after our academics as much as possible. You know, they, they, they might be our clients or our customers, but um, we have their uh, best interests at heart. We're, we're not in it for making the money. We're in it for getting the technology out. So, um, yeah, I would trust my colleagues to, to support anybody and actually go to the ends of the earth to actually do the right thing by our academics. Um, and we've had instances where, uh, you know, we, we could have been hard, but we don't. We play it, as they say in cricket, with a straight bat and, um, are, uh, and try to be as supportive as we possibly can. And I think going, going further than that, if... Um, I ever won the lottery, um, I think I would donate money to the, to the seed fund to um, invest in businesses because I think um, you know, that's the only way we're going to get the technology out there because the demand side from um, existing businesses, uh, especially in the UK, is not what you'd hope for. You know, f from they see the technology is too early. Um, I don't know where it fits in the in the value chain. It's 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 too disruptive. Um, if I take your project on, I've got to kill one of my own. Um, if I take your project on, I lose face because it. I'm saying that my the, the things I've invented or or I'm progressing within the company are rubbish. Um, you know, it's, it's the usual not invented here type, type statements. So that's what's pushing us more and more to form the spin-out <coughs> companies around technology, pull um, investment in, progress the technology, sell on the whole kit and caboodle at the end. Um, I mean, in addition to that, we've got technologies that don't fit in that format. So single asset uh, biologicals, what's it, single biological assets I should say, so um, things which could be treatments for disease, some things you just can't get investment because the attrition rate's too high, you know, people are almost certainly going to lose the money. So in those cases we've recently formed a licensing fund um, along with Imperial and UCL and three pharma companies, um, AZ, GSK, and J&J, &J, to put a 40 million pound um, licensing fund together. So what we do there is, rather than try and form a spin-out company and raise uh, investment, we send the project in um, to, to the fund, it's called the uh, Apollo Therapeutics Fund, and they decide whether they want to put some money behind it to develop the, the technology within the organisation and if they do and they develop it on, they develop it to a point where one of those pharma companies is going to bid for it and going to take a licence. And the, the, the underlying intellectual property is still owned by the university that submitted the project 
and then the licensing deal um, is split 50-50 between Apollo and the university. So that's you know, an example of an innovation that um, we've developed uh, along with other partner universities to um, try and solve a problem of, of lack of investment for, for certain assets. You were first. Hi, this is probably the, um, well, one of the main questions I would like to ask, um, especially the, the guy from uh, British, uh, from England here. Yeah. Uh, regarding the Brexit, so how have you seen the, uh, <laughs> sorry. Have you seen the, the number of patents actually affecting by the, the de facto funding which is coming from the EU itself getting diminishing and uh, what will be the, the future of the, <laughs> the uh, patent, number of patents and quality patents that, that will come out from you know, Cambridge and Oxford, but especially, especially mm, mm, mm. Because of funding actually uh, getting diminishing, you haven't... Yeah, so I love talking about Brexit. <laughs> Um, who knows what the hell's going to happen? We're going to leave, we're not going to leave, we're going to have a deal, we're not going to have a deal, who, who knows? We'll, we'll wait and see. Um, I think, you know, Cambridge, uh, I, you may not have been in a room when I, I mentioned, so Cambridge voted 75% as, uh, as a city to stay in. Um, partly because I think the people around Cambridge are probably a little more enlightened than many of the other parts of the UK. Um, but... Um, also, the university receives a hundred million pounds worth of funding from the European Research Council every year. That's a big hole we've got to fill. That's 20% of our research funding. Now, in the short term, the government has promised to fill that hole. But how long that will last, who knows? I think, you know, if... Um, and I think I said this earlier, so I don't mind repeating it again. Uh, that... Uh, how, well, as I say, how, how long will that last from the government? If it was coming out of the EU, we could be pretty sure that it's going to be 100 million for a very long time. But from the government, who knows? Will it affect our, our patenting? Only if it affects the quality of the research output. If we've still got the quality of the research output, we'll still be filing patents, we'll still be you know, filing priority patents in the UK and, and then going PCT and, and taking things into nationals in Europe. Um, as far as the patenting process, in or out of the EU doesn't matter, we're still part of Europe, so we're still locked into the, the European um, patenting process. Um, all, the, all that legislation will continue. Do you mean that you've not changed your procedure? No. How, how, do you, how do you decide when to fund research using uh, like translational research funds, uh, other, other funding mechanisms versus spinning it, spinning it off, incorporating it into a university spin-off, and then getting other funding sources for early stage research? So as, as uh, Kathy mentioned, we're, we're trying to do the best for the technology. Um, and that's to progress the technology as far and as fast as we possibly can. Um, we've got our own proof of concept fund. Um, it's not very big. So anything that's requiring uh, millions of pounds, we're looking for translational research money, either from the charities or the research councils. We help our academics to apply for that um, all the time. It's part of developing the technology. Um, beyond that, is there a licensee? They would be the first, first place to go to um, license the technology uh, if there's an existing company because they're likely to have the mechanisms to get it in the marketplace as soon as possible so it reaches more people um, and we would see returns more immediately. Um, other than that, uh, it's the licensing fund, if that's appropriate. If it's a you know, single asset biological, then we'll be going down the licensing fund route. If 
um, that's not available, then it's um, you know spin out and attract investment. But it depends on other criteria. Um, you know, we, if we're looking at spin out, the the team's got to be behind that, or we've got to generate a, t a team to do that, because a spin out is more about the team than the actual technology. Um, uh, you know, that's what you're investing in. Um, because uh, when you form a spin-out company, if you've got a good team and the technology doesn't work, they'll find another way of making that company work and it be successful. If you've got a good technology and the team's no good, well, the company's going to bomb anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's, we're paying a lot more attention to the team if we're doing um, a spin-out. I'm curious how, how many ECT uh, patents you actually file uh, in, in, in Cambridge, and um, do you have extensive filing in, in Asia as well, like especially China, because the, of the uh, innovation has been innovating uh, all around the mm. world. Mm. So um, when you come to look at the, the presentation, there are some figures on there about PCT filings. I think we're, we're seeing at a ballpark, 150 disclosures, uh, filing around 50 patents, something like that, priority patents. About half of those, give or take, are um, going through the PCT process and, and going into national filings. Routinely, our national filing route would be uh, US, Europe, Japan. Um, anything else is a special case. So that would need to be carefully considered. But would we routinely <coughs> file in China? Probably not at the moment. I mean, that's, that's probably going to change, you know, but that's, that's just where we are now. And that's one of the, um, you know, the developing and changing spheres that we're, we're all seeing. Talking about the, uh, regarding to the question from the other uh, uh, distinguished guest, um, what the criteria, the minimum criteria, do you have any minimum criteria to design what, what kind of project should, shall be uh, licensed? Are there any technology, technology uh, readiness level, DRL uh, criteria in your consideration or not? That is the first question. And uh, the other is that. Uh, sometimes when you want to have the uh, good deal, sometimes or you have a good network with the company already, then you can have uh, some problem from the company for doing the research. That is maybe what that is more targeted to the to that company. So I would like to, to know about the the ratio of the, the project that regarding to that uh, specific or targeted project and. Uh, um, uh, the technology that are developed by your own uh, inside or, or the, your, your own uh, rainforest or something mm. like that. Mm. Mm. So you, you, you said you your pretty prefer to have rainforest than the plantation. Mm. So in that case, uh, how it can fit with the company uh, needs or something like that. So the university has a, a drive, obviously, to attract as much um, sponsored research funding uh, as, as, as it can. Um, that's handled by our research office, and we try not to get involved, other than helping them to negotiate IP clauses. But they, they're usually pretty, pretty good with that. Um, how much of those things do we then see flow into uh, Cambridge Enterprise to um, put the ensuing options and licenses together? Not very much. Um, it seems 
perhaps unusual, but predictable, that the more constrained an academic is by the sponsored research agreement, the less inventive he's likely to be. So, um, certainly we've, we've negotiated some university, or been involved in, as I say, the, the research office that generally does the, research, uh, the negotiation, but we get involved on IP clauses. Um, there are some big university-wide uh, sort of template agreements with big multinational companies where they've taken years to negotiate. Um, and finally, you've got to a, a solution which is probably fairly well stacked in the um, commercial company's favour where, interestingly, no academics have ever signed up to it. And, and that's a great shame, but, um, you know, that's coming back to the earlier question. Um, if you're going to have um, essentially punitive arrangements as far as the academics are concerned, they're not going to want to get involved. And so they won't create things and you won't get any output and uh, you might as well not bother. The more, the more you t try and tie someone down, you know, the less responsive they're going to be. There's got to be something in it for them. We've had more success with uh, sponsored research arrangements where that does go through the option, fair negotiation, and the academics see something coming back, uh, which is going to come to them and to their research group, etc. Uh, the other problems that we have are when an academic signs up to a research collaboration and they're all pretty much tied in and they're happy to have the research money and, and perhaps it's a bit extra um, than, than just covering the costs and then um, you know a new PhD student or postdoc starts and they're on the project and no one bothered to mention to them that all their intellectual property is going straight into the company. Um, you know, that, that's a loophole that we've had to work quite hard at as a university to make sure that everyone is aware of everything um, going forward, because it's amazing how, how that can get forgotten. Um, have I missed anything there? Sorry? Oh, the criteria. Yeah, so the cri evaluation criteria. I mean, it, it's a question that's often asked. Um, you know, and Cathy went through a bit of it before. But, um, the, the, and I know we're a bit short of time, we've got one minute left. Um, the, um, the main things I would say is, you know, does it obey the laws of physics? Uh, can we um, establish whether it's patentable or not? Um, if it is, and there's some feasibility of us being able to work with the academics and you know, find a commercialization route for the technology, then we'll take a punt on it. And it may be that it's going to be some years before we um, actually commercialize, and we're going to have to develop it a long way, but that's fine. Sorry, perhaps one last one then from over here, if it's quick. Yes, quick. So you could. Um, on this slide, 99 Nobel laureates. Yes. So, don't many, ask me how, who they are. How many performance in the table? Uh, chemistry. Ooh. Is that for am I, am I clear? Yes, you are, yeah. You are very clear. Unfortunately, <laughs> I have no idea. I, I can't, I couldn't name any that we've worked with or commercialized any of their technology. A lot of them are from some time ago, but you know, it ticks up by one or two every year. Mm -hmm. But I, d I don't recall anyone who's a Nobel laureate that we've commercialized anything for. Um, we've done lots of work with many Professor Sir blah de blah FRS a lot of that, but Nobel laureates, no, so I don't think so. Yes, and irrelevant to 
I, I, I would oh, well, I would hope that um, you know that they wouldn't disregard working with us or disregard <coughs> commercializing anything. It's just that it just hasn't hasn't happened, and you know the, the university is. 50% arts, humanities, and social sciences, and I'm sure some of those Nobel laureates were in that area. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for coming today and uh, spending time with us. I've really enjoyed it, I hope you have. And uh, let's hope that this sort of uh, conference happens again in the future. <laughs>